Hello my friends, today we're going to do the first of likely several videos on our channel discussing the Woman King movie. If you're new here, we teach about Africa in the majority of our videos, so subscribe if you want to learn more. This first video will be a short analysis of the visuals of the movie. I'm going to be showing you some of the real life versions of what is depicted in the film. If you don't know, this film is inspired by the Fawn People's warriors known as the Ahosai aka Dahomey Amazons, who were an all-female military regiment of the Kingdom of Dahomey. And I'll quickly note that these women go by some other names as well, but I prefer to use the term Ahosai. Alrighty, this first scene shows us a bunch of riders on horseback who are carrying spears and shields. These kinds of shields, commonly referred to as Galgua, were produced by a number of different ethnic groups who lived primarily in northern Cameroon, but also the bordering countries of Nigeria and Chad. These people include the Mandara Kingdom, also referred to as the Wandala Kingdom, as well as other ethnic groups like the Gadoof and the, <laughs> Gadoof, the Vera, the Zulgo, and more. I have more details to teach you about this shield and other things we'll see in The Woman King, but as stated previously, this first video is meant to be a short overview. Our next scene brings us to the Dahomey Kingdom, with the male soldiers on the left, the female soldiers on the right, and the king on the central platform. This gazebo structure looks pretty good, though I will say that if they wanted to, they could have gone with something more colorful, like what you see here in this historical painting. You may also notice some fancy umbrellas in the background. Those are also real and are depicted in the same historical painting. And finally, hanging on the wall in the distance is a Dahomey applique, which is a kind of ornamental fabric. I intend to make a video going into more detail about the Dahomey appliques in the future. Now we zoom in to see King Gezo, who ruled from 1818 to 1858. Here he's holding a royal scepter that is sometimes referred to as a rakad, but its proper Dahomey name is Makpo, which literally means Staff of Fury. Shortly after seeing the king, we then get a proper view of the hero of the film named Naniska. She looks good, but they could have made the outfit more accurate. For example, I don't see why they skimped out on the calories. If you look at the actual Ahosai, they had a lot more calories on them. But whatever, this is a small nitpick in the grand scheme of things. The next scene I want to focus on takes place in this awesome throne room. Although these statues on the sides of the screen are difficult to see, I believe these are sculptures of horse. Hornbill birds, which are considered the king of birds among the fawn. The sculptures that are further back are even harder to see. In fact, I wasn't sure for a while what I was looking at. My first thought was that they might be Asen, which is a type of metal altar, which depicts scenes involving various characters, and I'm pretty sure I see a bunch of little characters on top of those things. However, the Asen are typically supported by a pole structure, whereas these are clearly not. So my second hypothesis was was that these are what are commonly referred to as fawn brass tableaus. That said, after looking at these things a bit longer, I couldn't help but be reminded of the Ashanti people's kudo vessels. But the problem with that is none of my African art books show any metal Dahomey vessels, and I cannot find any reliable website that shows a metal vessel coming from the Fawn people. Emphasis on reliable website. Eventually, it dawned on me, oh yeah, I can just zoom in on the screen and get a better look at this. That was pretty silly of me to not think of that sooner. And once I zoomed in, my suspicions were confirmed. That is indeed a kuduo. These kinds of metal vessels are found in Ghana and are crafted by the Akan peoples, one of which is the famous Ashanti ethnic group. If any of you out there watching can show me some proof of a legitimate educational source that shows an equivalent to Homie Vessel, I would love to see it. Having said all that, the reality is most historical films retcon history to some extent. I suppose this isn't a huge issue, considering there are bigger retcons in this film, but we aren't delving into that stuff today. But yeah, instead of Kuduo, the art director should have used the tableaus that I mentioned earlier. Moving toward the center of the frame, we'll see some members of the royal court sitting on Dahomey-style stools, which we get a better view of in a later scene. Beyond the members of the court, we can see some swords placed vertically on stands. We'll get a better view of the swords later, but I just want to state that I'm not sure if the fawn swords were ever stored 
forward in such a vertical position in real life just seems kind of dangerous, you know? However, I did happen upon a pretty interesting line in an old book of mine that describes the statue of a warrior figure by the artist Akati Akeple Kendo. Within the description of this artwork, it states the following. On the figure's head is a spiky crown of weapons, tools, and iron icons, miniatures of large weapons which once surrounded the figure in its palace war shrine. Similar weaponry miniatures are also a prominent feature of shrines dedicated to Gu. So yeah, based on that description, it does make me think that perhaps this vertical arrangement of these weapons are actually accurate. Directly behind the swords and on the columns of this palace, we can see clay relief panels, also referred to as earthen bass reliefs. These colorful images famously decorate the real Dahomey palaces as well. But, despite how cute and cartoony the Dahomey art style is, some of these panels depict some really violent stuff from their military history. Getting back to the topic of stools, we can just barely see the king's throne. Some of my longtime viewers may remember that we highlighted one of these Dahomey thrones in my Top 10 African Thrones video. As for what spot it won on my Top 10 list, well the answer is, it didn't. Yep, that's right, I only gave it an honorable mention. Don't get me wrong, Gezo has a nice throne and all, but there's a lot of other amazing thrones in Africa too. The last thing in the throne room I want to highlight are these wonderful windows. Window frames. These gourd-like pottery-shaped window sculptures can be seen in the windows of this old fawn temple. Once we are outside the palace, we see Gezo again, but this time he's wearing a blue garment that is reminiscent of what he wears in this old historical painting of him. And I'm sure you've noticed he's holding a sword, so at this point I'm gonna go ahead and highlight all the best images of swords we've seen in the movie so far. As you can see, there are a number of different sword varieties in this film, and that tracks with reality as well. As far as I am currently aware, the Dahomey have at least two names for swords, Gubasa and Hui. Any sword with geometric designs cut into the middle of the blade is considered a Gubasa. This is confirmed in the book The Royal Arts of Africa, The Majesty of Form, and in other sources as well. Most of the other Dahomey swords seem to fall under the category of Hui. However, academic sources don't seem to agree on how to label some of these cutlasses. For example, the most elaborate Dahomey swords tend to have animals and sometimes even humans depicted on their blades, and according to the Brooklyn Museum, this type of cutlass is a gubasa. But in the book African Arms and Armor, it's considered a hui. So I don't know which source is correct on this, but either way you can see that the real Dahomey swords do in fact come in many shapes and sizes, so the variety on display in this movie makes sense. This next scene has one of the better views of the Dahomey architecture, and as you can see, it's looking good. I'm glad the film is using the more traditional raffia roofs instead of those metal ones that came during the colonial period. A little later on, they show us a scene with a practice dummy. I'm pretty sure this is not real. If it was, I probably would have seen it in an art book or a museum website by now. I'm no military expert, but I think African soldiers trained by sparring with each other and not with a thing like this. Shortly after that scene, we see a woman fighting a masquerader. Now, the Dahomey do have masks like the one I'm showing you here, but the Dahomey masks are not often highlighted in academic sources, so I can't say whether this mask that we see in the film is real or not. But I will say this scene is unrealistic, because generally speaking, Africans respect masks and the spirits they represent, so it would be a big taboo for most Africans to beat up a masquerader like this lady is doing in this scene. The ladies continue to show their prowess in this segment here. This double-tipped spear is surprisingly hard to confirm, though if you saw my last African Swords video, you'll know that double-bladed swords existed in Africa, so this double-tipped spear is certainly plausible. As for the ritual involving this man and woman testing their endurance against each other, I'm not currently aware of such a practice. I'll have to research that more sometime in the future, but it's possibly just something they made up for the film. But before we move on, I'd like to point out that the colorful striped garments the soldiers are wearing are accurate. The white and blue stripes 
are the most common, but I have seen other colors before too. In this brief clip, we get to see the decorated doors of the Dahomey. Although we don't get a great view of them, they appear to look faithful to the real doors. Some time later, we get to witness a religious ceremony with a statue at its center. I believe this is likely a Bosio figure. I look forward to seeing how this scene plays out. I'm glad that they're representing the faith of the Fawn. It'll allow us to see the spiritual side of these warrior women. In this final part, we witness a battle taking place. The male Dahomey soldiers are equipped with guns, and the Dahomey warrior women wield their swords. So what I want to explain to you here is that, yes, women also used guns. However, there was a special unit of the Ahosai who only used swords. The following comes from an article from the University of Western Australia's website. Father Bochi, quoting Father Borgiro, who was present in 1861 at a military review in Obomi, describes these regiments that the Europeans call Amazons. Out of 3,000 women, 200 instead of rifles are equipped with large cutlasses in the form of razors, which are wielded with two hands and a single blow slices a man down the middle. 